Hi everyone, Fiona Valentine here. I'm talking with artist and educator Ian Roberts today. Welcome Ian to The Confident Artist. Nice to meet you Fiona and hello, hello to everyone else. So why don't we start off by you telling us a little bit about your art making and, and your art career. Tell us who you are. Well, I, I, had, I was lucky in the sense that my father was a painter and I grew up surrounded by him and his friends, outdoor landscape painting, what we now refer to as plein air painting. And I was on painting trips with him at 11 years old, listening to the critiques of all these different artists at the end of the day, looking at each other's work. And the thing that was most it's astonishing, well, it wasn't astonishing to me at 11, but what I think about now is an opportunity. What was astonishing that I had the opportunity is they didn't talk about, oh, I like the way you painted that boat. They were always talking about how I like the way you've got that big shape moving up against that little light one there. They were always talking about really the design and the composition of the paintings they were doing. And so I kind of got that part instilled in me really young. And somehow when I came to teaching maybe 25 years ago, I was teaching landscape painting and I realized, well, composition, I mean, that's it. You know, you can have, doesn't matter the medium, you know, maybe it's oil paint or watercolor or um, acrylics, or you could say I'm interested in still life or portraits or landscape, or I'm interested in a really realistic high definition technique or a more impressionistic thing or something that's looser. They all rest on, founda on the foundation of composition. They're all, all of them. And so it's sort of the, if you don't get that piece together, it seemed to me, then there's like a very big piece missing from your painting. So I've kind of focused on that. And just the one other thing is uh, years ago, I, I made a video on composition and uh, Northlight Books sold it for a while. And the, the group at Northlight Books, they asked all their 250,000 members, what, did you really, what do you really want a course on or a book on? Mm -hmm. And they said composition. And so they asked me to write it. And that has since sold 45,000 copies, which is a lot of books. And what you realize from that is, I mean, Fiona likes the book and she you know, says the book is good and so on like that. But obviously, whether people bought it and read it, it's a different issue. But obviously people recognize the need for it. Yes, absolutely. And that's how I found you was I was just waving my copy of the book while you were chatting about seven years ago when I came across your book because a, an art teacher here in Melbourne had helped open my eyes to the importance of composition. I spent six weeks going through your book and it totally changed my painting. And since um, in the years I've been teaching, it's just been fundamental. Yeah. So, so important to start thinking in terms of shape and you articulate that so well which is partly why I'm so excited to introduce you to everyone at The Confident Artist. There was, it's interesting what you're saying there, because I remember there was a lovely guy who eventually became quite a good friend and he came on my workshops in Provence as my assistant, you know, driving the van and helping with the luggage and so on like that. Lovely guy. But I met him because he was at a, one of those art fairs and there was a woman there who had a whole bunch of paintings some over here, some over here. And, and Jamie knew enough about painting to say, wow, there's a big difference between that group and that group. What happened? And he said, that's before Ian Roberts, that's after Ian Roberts, because it just changed the way they thought about what those shapes are doing on the picture plane and how they connect, because that's it. You know, that's yeah. really what the painting is. And that the more you learn to be thinking in terms of those shapes and masses and less in terms of houses and trees, well, for one thing, it gets much easier to paint masses than houses and trees because you can leave a lot of information out in masses 
that when you still think you're painting a house, you still you still think about oh, all those little cross things in the window. I got to get those in. Oh God, there's bricks everywhere. You just forget about that stuff because you realize it's no longer that important. That's right. Yeah, and it's it's so helpful to get those main solid things to hang your idea on right. Um, the other thing I love about your teaching and your approach and is is that everything's figure outable, practicable, learnable. And if you break things down so that you're studying things one at a time and consolidating that with practice, that's really effective. Can you talk a little bit about practice and how you see that fitting into the growth of a, a new artist? Well, you know, practice is an interesting thing, or let, let's say painting regularly, because first, when you look at it, um, practice is the mother of skill, is an expression, right? And painting is a series of skills, you know? I mean, there's no point in pretending that, say, perspective is going to happen automatically. It means slowing down, figuring out how it works, and then coming back to your practice. And if you don't do that, it's a little like a pianist who's got a fairly easy piece, but then there's a complex part in the middle that, that just muddles them, but they never practice that part because ah, it's hard. I mean, if you, the whole picture, and the difference between a piano player is you can play the first movement or something that's easy and everyone thinks, oh, it's pretty good. But if you're ever to play the whole piece, because it happens over time, you can make the first half look pretty good and never play the second half. But a painting arrives all at once. And so because it arrives all at once, what happens is if there's any weakness in your painting, like say perspective being an obvious example, or your understanding of value, or certainly your understanding of say something like uh, intensity and color, it's apparent, we can all see it. So the idea of practice is interesting because first off, you know that thing, uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a, uh, a book called Outliers, I think, which was, about 10,000 hours of practice. And it was very interesting because the guy that did the research, a Dr. Erickson, I think in Florida, was very interesting because he said that Malcolm Gladwell kind of misrepresented the research. I mean, I don't think intentionally, but I mean, he's writing a book, a guy's brilliant. He's doing you know, as good a job as he can to make it engaging, but he sort of misrepresented it because first off the 10,000 hours was the average number of hours of 20 year olds. If he'd done it 18 year olds, the average number of hours would have been 8,750, which is a way less catchy number, right? And of course, it's not even beginning to look at the idea that if you're playing in Carnegie Hall, it's probably over 50,000 hours. So 10,000 hours is just kind of a number, but somehow everybody gets the idea that if you do 10,000 hours of practice, you will end up being good. But the point is, and this was Dr. Erickson's point, you can spend 10,000 hours badly. His point was it's decisive practice. That was his word, decisive practice, which means honing in on, burrow, burrowing in on the points where you're weak, the points where you need uh, to put more attention. So you can imagine somebody saying that, oh, I went out and painted three times this week and I, you know, I'm putting in two, three, four hours of painting, but you may just be copying or, or just repeating the same old mistakes over and over and over again. You're not opening the process up and seeing what the mechanics are and then, you know, working on those things. Like I, there was just to use perspective as an example. Again, I was talking to a student the other day and they said, no, 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 perspective. God, I think I've got four or five books on perspective, which means they certainly know the need to learn it, but they've never stopped and sort of taken the, you know, put the lift the hood up and look at the mechanics of how they're going to actually make uh, perspective work. So that's one thing. Practice is just essential. But the second thing about practice is in my book, Creative Authenticity, sort of 16 principles of creativity, one of them is called the dance of avoidance. And no matter how long you've been in creative pursuit, 
you are always dealing with your own resistance, your dance of avoidance to getting started. Every single morning, I still go through it. The only thing that happens is time goes on, you become clearer about the tricks your psychology is creating to put hurdles in your way. And so by practicing daily or like two, three times a week and making those opportunities there, you make opportunities also in addition to just your skills of passing through that dance of avoidance so you become more conversant with it and you don't let it derail you and waste half or all of your time. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and there was something else I had. A, oh, I know what the other thing is. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's just right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, the other thing is what happens, and it gets back to this uh, masses. The more you go to practice your painting, the more your brain shifts to sort of, we call it a right brain mode, although technically I'm not sure scientists still talk about it in left and right brain, but still that idea of spatial relationships as opposed to linear logical ones. And so the more you go and do it two, three times a week, the more your brain shifts and your neurological pathways shift there quicker and you arrive in that state more often and you find yourself flipping into that state just all the time. You just start seeing shapes all the time. It's, oh, that's interesting. So those are three aspects of practice. It's not just about getting better because there's neurological shifts that I have to make and there's psychological ones you've got to work through. Absolutely. I've really noticed that. And when another artist can articulate that phenomenon for you and then you start to recognise it in yourself and in your practice, it really does equip you to press through that dance of avoidance that psychological resistance and find a routine that supports your creativity and helps you not think, you know, do I feel like painting today? Right. Wrong question. <laughs> right. What skill am I working on at the moment? What painting am I doing my best with at the moment? It seems to me that those kinds of questions um, have helped me to move forward, you know, and recognizing I can't learn it all at once that I really do have to focus on the next thing and practice that for a while. And then if I've done that for a month or so, a year later, I look back and think, I don't even know how it changed, but something's changed. Right. And that skill has, it's there now and it wasn't there before. And that's exciting. Well, one of the things you, you say, I mean, it's like, you know, people, say, you know, and I'm sure you've heard it a hundred times where people say, oh, geez, I can't even draw a stick figure, right? And you're like, yeah, so have you ever practiced piano? No, I never played piano. So how's your piano playing? Well, it's obviously just as bad as the stick figure. So the idea people have is like, oh, I haven't got any talent. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, there's no point in my painting. The, the interesting thing is that as you're saying, as you're saying, you can learn this. Someone that has never painted can learn this. It's not easy. I mean, like taking up piano is not easy. Taking up tennis and trying to become a great tennis player, it's not easy. Learning to paint is not easy, but all three of them, with the exception maybe of tennis because of what happens to your knees at a certain point, you can just practice forever. You can just practice forever because you're never, I mean, Titian said at 80, after having painted for 65 years, he says, oh, now I think I'm getting the hang of it. You know, you realize there's just no end to how much the arena has to offer. And that's part of its charm. And of course, part of its frustration, because there is so much to make a good painting work that has to be integrated all at the same time. And that's why even the old masters used to do grisaille. They paint in black and white until they got the composition organized and then glazed their colors in, you know? They recognized how hard it is um, yeah. to do it all at once. I like what you say that that's the frustration and the charm. And when you can embrace that and take your eyes off, I've got to produce an amazing painting and make it about enjoying the game of moving on and growing and knowing that you can keep improving the whole of your life. I think there's a real joy in that and in moving forward in that way. So if you were going to list out a handful of areas that a, a newbie 
should look to learn and to, to practice, what would be in your top five? Obviously, composition and perspective, I would think, are in there. What else? Well, uh, you, I think, Fiona, are you putting the course that I did with it's sort of free master in composition course, it's online. Are you giving that to your students? Yeah, yeah. Can Absolutely. Yeah, we'll be but sharing I, that with this interview. Going over here. So I did a course. I, ta I taught it uh, actually as a pilot last month with about 20 students just to sort of see how it worked. And then I'm going to roll that out into a course probably sometime in January, February. But the idea is of drawing and using drawing as a means to understand how masses are created on a picture plane, you know, the two dimensional mm -hmm. piece of canvas and how you're carving depth into the picture plane. Because every time you make marks that remind us of the picture plane, which happens with people's brush marks, with too intense color, with, you know, anything that is destroying the illusion, we come back and we, we've, you've lost the illusion. So, you, you know, if you, get all your colors out and your big canvas and you say, oh, I'm going to make a great painting of this. You're putting a fair amount artistically on the line because it might not work. And if it doesn't work, oh God, I'm so used to this, I don't know how to paint. Uh, or there's another one that didn't work. Or you get two thirds of the way in and you kind of like parts, but you don't know how to finish it and you're confused about what to do. And so you put it aside and start another one. But here's the thing with drawing. Most people's drawings, are done way too fast. The idea of thumbnails, just lightning speed and useless as, as a learning experience and as a tool to make a better painting. But in that, in that um, course, which I think is like, you know, it's maybe 15 minutes with some exercises on how to do, how to create masses with a pencil. Because the pencil is a point, right? It's the exact opposite of a mass. And what most people, you know, like students describe their drawing as like chicken scratches, you know, these scratchy sort of marks that remind us over and over and over again, dark pointy marks on a white piece of paper of the point of the scratchy marks and the picture plane. So the idea of learning to, to lay in these value masses that just start working as masses that go back into space. So there's that one, and then there's a second video that's maybe a little longer where I demo a whole drawing, and then a couple of additional uh, examples you can use. You sort of get a sense of, oh, I could use this to see what, I, what is gonna happen to my image when I try to translate it into paint. And it saves you the headache and the heartache of devoting yourself to this big one, you can try to solve it small first. And of course, again, the old masters, you can just see pages and pages and pages of old master drawings of how they figured these compositions out in advance before they started. And then of course, the other part of it is that by doing it and just devoting maybe 20 minutes a day to doing these drawings, uh, you start building up a practice of finding things, of having your brain shift towards this mass making, of working through this dance of avoidance. And so it's just a way that even if you said, look, I'm just gonna do the drawing for six months. You say, oh no, but I'm a painter. Just do it for six months and it will change the way you paint because it'll change the way you see, both in terms of composition and in terms of how you're making masses work in space. So that would be, I mean, I'm doing this set of online courses now, and there are three subjects. There'll be a fourth, but I'm, I'm working on the pilots of three. First is the drawing one. And the next two are the, the two things that attract everybody, loose brushwork and color. Everybody loves loose brushwork and color. But the truth is, if I had a painting by Sargent or Soroy or something like that, you realize when you look at their paintings, you don't really see the brushwork unless you're looking for it. Those marks are 
such perfect value, such perfect color, and such perfect drawing shape, drawing with a brush, mm -hmm. that you don't notice the brush, the brush mark because they're perfect. They just sit right embedded into the illusion. And the problem with most student work is you're just incredibly aware of a lot of distracting brush marks. So it's sort of addressing that issue. And color, everybody loves vibrant color. The problem is vibrant color only works if you understand color intensity or saturation or chroma. Yeah. And if you don't understand how you mute colors so that the whole thing is pulled down into an incredibly muted hole, and then you just advance one or two colors where you want them such that they bring the painting to life, that's a master colorist, not somebody that slaps a ton of high chroma color all over his painting. So exactly. I'm teaching those, I'm developing those things because at the same time, they're the thing that people want. They're also the things that are kind of holding them back. Yeah, it's true. And it's uh, so much about getting things in the right order. And you can't ice your cake and put the cherry on top until you've measured your ingredients and baked it. Um, I actually made the mistake of using that illustration with 11 year old boys. They thought icing the mixture was an excellent idea. But for most of us, we want to bake our cake before we ice it. <laughs> Um, and I think it's kind of like that in the, the painting process when you get things in the right order and um, understand the priority, the whole thing works. But as you say, if you've just got bright colour, if you've just got loose brushwork without the fundamentals, the cake of composition and perspective and value, it's not going to hang together. It's not going to work. Uh, and the problem is we're all experts at seeing, even if we know nothing about art, We've seen the real world and we, we know when it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but that's particularly true of figures, right? Because, you know, a tree can be all kinds of shapes and still pass for a tree and a hill can be all kinds of shapes and still pass on a cloud. But the figure is like, whoa, anything is wrong. We know the way a face looks. We know way, you know, you, you know, you see your friend a hundred yards away and you know it's your friend somehow by the way they walk or something. And you realize, God, with, with figures, it's 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 brutally honest when something's not working. Yeah. Even a few millimeters or a millimeter makes a difference to the likeness, which is incredible, yeah. but painful yeah. but true, right? Exactly. Um, no, when, when you describe this thing of, of cake, you know, it makes me think of the armature that a, um, a sculptor uses, you know, it's metal and they put the clay on it and that's like the composition. It's the, it's the backbone yeah. of what makes the painting work and the bright, you know, the, the, the vibrant color and the loose brushwork, the thing that attract everybody like the icing is like the clay and the clay can't hold itself up on its own. It needs that armature, it needs that steel pole in order to stand up. And so it's just kind of a, you know, a metaphor for the, um, the necessity. Well, you know the other thing too about composition, which it's how much of composition needs to happen before you put brush to canvas. Yeah. And most people are so excited. There's a, a, run, a wonderful line by Richard Rousseau, an American novelist. And he said, um, and I'm paraphrasing because I, I don't remember exactly, but it's like hunger always strips, outstrips ability. And that's good. It means like your hunger to make something creative is outstripping your ability. That's fine. But if you let your hunger outstrip your ability too far, then you, it just becomes apparent that you can't, you can't say, you can't give expression to your hunger. Uh, the expression needs the, the solidity of ability. And so um, it's just intriguing in a way. I can't remember, I was saying something and I just lost my train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, I've lost it too because I'm thinking too much about what you're saying and where it's going. <laughs> We've both lost the train, but um, 
I think realizing that, oh, because we're so fast to get the paint on the canvas. Oh, no, that's it. Yes, yeah. that was it. And so the idea that, you know, you're teaching a painting workshop, like in the south of France, and it's beautiful, and the van door opens, and oh, cypress trees and lavender. Well, I don't paint when there's lavender. That was hopeless. But, uh, you know, all these beautiful things and vineyards, and they're out there, and, and they're just in such a hurry to get their, can their brush on the canvas. And the painting probably is ruined before they start because there is no, there's no way to juggle all these different aspects of making a painting and then sort of start confronting the major compositional problems about halfway through. I mean, you just can't do it. It's gone. And so that whole thing of sort of, whoa, 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 slow down here, slow down. Let's make a thumbnail that makes it really clear where my entry is into the painting, how I'm getting from the foreground into the middle ground, how my background is sort of offering a, a foil for these middle ground elements, and how I'm leading us there and where I want the eye to go. Where is the hit of color? Most people are looking at a building or something as the center of interest, but sometimes it's just the intersection of two things with a little bit of color on it just to sort of hold it together. Um, but boy, if you don't figure that out beforehand, you're just, you're, you're just burying yourself. And once you start to see the putting the paint on the canvas is just part of the process and you start to unlock the uh, more invisible parts of the process that come before the design, um, all of the skills that go into being able to draw a design, plan a design and understand how to bring in the, the colour on top of that. When you start to see how to do that, it becomes such a fascinating thing to, to work out the process, to work out the thumbnail, to think it through before you start to put the paint on the canvas. And um, I've found that's added so much enjoyment to the process to realize, oh, it's, it doesn't start when I put my brush on the canvas. It starts a long time before that. And that's in some ways almost uh, the most interesting part of the process for me. So it's helpful that you well, articulate it's, it's that. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting you say that because, um, well, I think your point is well taken in the sense, or I mean, I'm taking it, I think it's a good point, is that, I think you really start to make inroads into improving your painting process when you realize the role that all that needs to play in advance and you start to enjoy it. Yeah. But it's yeah. not a kind of mindless, or somebody told me to do a thumbnail, so I'll do a thumbnail kind of thing. But you're really starting to think the thing through in advance because it's just not gonna work. I mean, it's not to say that, I don't know, one out of 15 paintings works and you're sort of really excited. And then the next, and then you think, oh, look, I'm really making, and then the next several, oh God, what's going on? I mean, of course, every now and again, things will work. But if you wanna get really consistently better, you have to put the time in before you begin to paint. It's just, yeah. everybody does. Yeah. You know, I mean, you may look at, if you're watching an artist, an experienced artist doing a demo, it may look like he just sets up and bangs in and bang, but there are so many experiences yeah. that are leading to his knowing what to do that they're still going on. It's just, they happen much, much faster with a yeah. ton of experience. Exactly. And I say that to my classes a lot, that when you watch a workshop by a master, he's juggling 30 skills at once that have taken his career to pull together. Don't go home and beat up on yourself because you couldn't reproduce what he did in the same amount of time. Instead, let it inspire you to go back and break down those skills and tackle them one at a time until then you can put them together um, because you'll enjoy the journey of learning each skill much more than the defeat of trying to reproduce what this maestro has done in front of you after years and years of learning. I think in the beginning, I just didn't know 
how to practice. I didn't know, should I put this tree here or here? Or like, does it make any difference? And studying with um, artists here in Melbourne and then discovering your resources, that was kind of the beginning for me of going, oh, wow, there are things I can learn, things that other artists have articulated that makes sense of where I put my tree and how I figure out what I want to say and how the whole right. thing fits together. And that right. just, yeah, changed everything for me. So I'm, I'm really excited to um, introduce you to everybody today. And I'm excited that you're taking what you've written in your books that I've enjoyed and you're putting it into this online course. Thank you so much for sharing the, the pilot with us. Um, I think it's a great taster and I hope it inspires everyone to, dive in deep and learn those skills. So thanks for sharing with us today, Ian. I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's, it. it's a pleasure, um, Fiona. Thank you very much for asking me to, to join you. It was great. All right. Well, we'll um, look forward to seeing the rest of your material coming out and um, I'll share that link for your freebie with everybody at the Confident yeah. Artist. Great. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. Bye for now.